evening. Please open your Bibles to 1 Kings and chapter 17. It'll take me a while to get there, but I want you to find the page and then listen to a little bit of background before I get into the message. <clears throat> Being a widow has got to be a fretful position for a woman. It's um, in, in old the history of uh, nations hasn't been so prosperous as it is now, and many widows in past generations found themselves destitute when they were a widow. Their husband dead, they had no one to provide. <clears throat> and that's what the topic of the message is, but before I get into it, um, the Lord gave me precious insight. Monday night he gave me this message, and I've been thinking about it since, of course. And I realized there's a human situation that I learned about and that reflects the gospel. That everything in life, if, if you see it right, shows you glory to God, glory to Christ, if you look at it correctly. And there's an event in my life that I learned about Japanese culture. Of course, those of you that know me um, that are here, you know, people listening on the web don't know. I've worked for the Japanese for 13 years. Prior to that, I worked for the Japanese um, as a customer not as frequent but about once a week work with Japanese I learned a little about a little bit about their customs um, talking to a young man that was married to a Japanese woman on one event he explained his fear to be married to a Japanese woman and I thought it was interesting I asked what what's it matter what's it matter if they're Japanese Chinese Asian American you know French German he said don't you know the history of Japanese women in regards to what? The samurai. No, I haven't studied ancient culture. He said, well, let me explain. Um, samurai come into town. They'd see some injustice going on. They had the right to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner. They took their sword out and cut the head off of anybody they thought worthy of death based on what they witnessed very powerful people in their society and it even comes into more modern days it's um, even people uh, people in Japan live by it um, when you see in the disposition of Japanese people they're always bowing they're always yielding they're always seem over fearful don't they that comes from that time in their society when the person you're talking to very well might have the authority to kill me they have a sword on their side they might be classified as samurai material and they might actually kill me if I do something wrong or say something wrong right now. So their society even today has that fingerprint on it of fear driven I might die. Well many women in the day when samurai were about killing people whoever they thought was worthy of death were widowed by that samurai they became the wife of the person that killed their husband. What a treacherous thing in the American mind. In an American mind what why would you be loyal to the person that killed your husband? Of course, this, from the perspective of the samurai, he judged that whatever that man was doing was unjust and worthy of death, and he took immediate action, and it was appropriate, and he was approved to do it. That woman was to yield. That woman was to yield and be remarried to that man. Now, this is a picture of the gospel. I know from my own experience of salvation that I, I became a widow the moment the Lord showed me that my first husband is dead. My first husband was a lie. My first husband was a criminal. My first husband deceived me to think he was a pretty nice guy and I'm not so bad either. And all that slaughtered in our lives and killed before us and we become married to Christ in the process of God overpowering Satan in our life. It's very interesting that Japanese culture includes such a gospel-rich analogy or similar path. And, and I think if we look at other societies, there's similar conditions where we see the gospel. If we look correctly, we see the gospel message in the way people are living um, because we know the real God. We know the real story, the real message. Let's read 1 Kings about a widow, chapter 17. Scripture shows a widow and thinking about the condition of a widow and how destitute this person is because their husband's no longer there. All their safety and comfort and the kindness of their life has just been destroyed. And it's a fearful condition. 
And what this woman in the story we're going to read here in this event in 1 Kings, this was an event, not a story. This event in 1 Kings chapter 17 is not only was she a widow, but she was in a country that was um, destitute itself, had no resources, was in a famine, and everybody was dying around her. So let's pick up the story. This was in Elijah, the prophet Elijah's day. Let's pick up the story in chapter 17 and verse 9. Arise, this is God telling Elijah, Arise, get thee to Zapheth, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So God's predestined every single thing in your life, in this woman's life, in this preacher's life. And God's telling this preacher, you go there and you do this. So he arose, verse 10, and went to Zarephath. Zara, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. He's doing what God, his father, told him to do. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Oh, bring, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. <laughs> okay, that was enough for her. She had to turn... She said, wait a minute, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but I have just a, just a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering these two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son and that we may eat it and, and then we're going to die. This little bit that we've got left, it's been there for months and that's all we've got. And we're finally going to eat this last bit, and there's no more after it. We're destitute. I'm going to die. Right, this is it. Elijah said unto her, Fear not. The mind of a widow, full of fear. Full of fear. Go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make it thee for thy son. Now she's thinking, you haven't heard a word I've said. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. God will provide all your need. Don't fear. You're safe. Verse 15, And she went in and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many, many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. <clears throat> and it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. He died. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sins to remembrance and to slay my son back in fear? Fear, widow's fear. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom, out of her arms, carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, thou hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slain her son? And he stretched them out upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. The soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. No more fear. No more fear. Finally, no more fear. So, so why, <clears throat> why bring up oh, the woman's fear in being a widow? When, when you find out that you're a widow, there's lots of fear because you don't have a sure foot anymore. The things that you once rested in and trusted on have been stripped away from you. They've been killed right in front of you. God's judgment has been proclaimed, and for the first time in your life, you believe them. You grasp it. You agree. 
that your false works are hate for God. And these things, but all of a sudden your life becomes pretty fearful. That's when you know you're a widow. That's when you know your false gods have been slain, been killed. Your first husband, the bad one, dead. <clears throat> but why does God judge man so harshly and sin so harshly? Turn, if you will, to Isaiah 13 by way of introduction. Listen to God's harsh judgment against man and against our sin nature, against what we fell in when Adam fell. Isaiah 13, just a few verses here, show God's harsh judgment against us. Isaiah 13, verse 6. And this is why widows fear, because they know the judgment of the Lord. Isaiah 13, verse 6. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as, as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and even man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. This is the fear, the fear that you go through. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. That's the harshest pain in this life. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. See the torment that God's going to put upon God-haters in judgment? Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth. When Christ comes forth in the final day, these things are going to come to pass. And the moon shall not cause her light to shine, and I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. This is God's judgment upon all those that rest on a false God. All those that go through their life and die out of their natural life, trusting in what he says in verse 11, iniquity. Iniqu he says three major words in iniquity, or in verse 11, iniquity, arrogancy, and pride. These are the things we fell into when we fell in Adam. That's all man possesses until God enlightened us. Iniquity is a false covering. It's that simple. It's what you cover your nakedness with. What You're not comfortable being naked. None of us are. Spiritually, you're not comfortable before the real judge, the real God, unless you cover your guilty conscience with something that you do to try to make you feel good before God. This is iniquitous acts. These are the works of man's hands that I'm told by God Almighty to tell you to run from, to flee from, identify them, see what they are, and don't do them anymore. You can't, you can't stop unless God give you the stop. But that's what a widow does. A widow realizes that all of those things that used to be dear and darling and comfortable are death and corruption and they stink. That first husband was a, was a whore. <clears throat> Arrogancy, the definition of arrogancy is amazing. It's ignorance of God. Arrogancy in this text right here is literally what Romans 10.3 says, for being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish our own righteousness, we have not submitted ourselves under the righteousness of God. If you don't know who the righteous God is, you are doing some type of a religious act that's your arrogance. You actually think something of yourself and what you do you're arrogant you're ignorant you know not the righteous holy savior and that's all what pride is pride saying i'm higher than god i can do it i can add to god's work and salvation no you can't god alone saves man can't add one thing to salvation but man insists if i walk an aisle it shows i'm serious if i pray a prayer certainly god will hear me if I repent from immoral acts, that surely will be accepted by God. These are all pride actions that are false covering that you do out of arrogance, and it's the outcome of the fall. Don't rest in them. Don't perform them. Be like a widow that realizes they're dead. They're worthless. God doesn't accept them. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1 now. We're not far from that. Isaiah chapter 1. I want to show you the cause of a widow. The cause of a widow. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. God telling 
all those that will hear him, his, his widows, <laughs> he causes you to become a widow. In verse 13 of Isaiah 1, bring no more vain oblations. I don't want your filth anymore. You, all you've ever brought me is filth. Your incense is an abomination unto me. The things that you thought would smell good in your life, the goodness about the best part of you, God says it reeks. The calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even a solemn meeting. He's not talking about smoking and drinking and doing immoral acts. He's talking about self-righteous works that you do to try to justify yourself before God, to cover your nakedness, your spiritual nakedness before him. It's your new moons, verse 14, your religious actions, your appointed feasts. My soul hates them, is what God tells you. They're trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. He, doesn't, he won't accept them, will not accept them. And when you spread forth your hands, this is a religious spreading forth of your hands. All self-righteous and religious, and you think you're going to try to make God save you. I will hide mine eyes from you, yea. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Your supposed righteousness is hate for Christ. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow. Become a widow by God's grace. If you ever kill your false gods in front of you, you're going to feel the cause of the widow. Destitute, doomed, in need, no ability. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Look at the reasoning of God Almighty. Though your sins be a scarlet, that's brilliant red guilty, blood guilty, they shall be white as snow, washed away, no trace of red. White as snow. There's nothing whiter than snow. You ever been in a snowstorm? It's amazing. White through and through. He says it again. Though they be red like crimson, that's so red it's almost purple. They shall be as wool. Wool is white through and through three-dimensional whiteness. That's all you'll be. This isn't something you can do. It's God's mercy upon you. If ye will be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, trust in your own righteousness, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness, lodged in it. But now, murderers. There's your first husband. Satan's just a murderer, a liar. Thy silvers become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. They have no idea what I'm talking about in this message. The cause of the widow is foreign to God-haters, it's foreign to the world, it's foreign to false preachers. They've never been put in a position where they're a widow, where their false god has been killed in front of their eyes, like a Japanese woman. That's my husband. That's my whole life. That's my whole being. That's my whole safety. And now he's dead. The widow's cause is that you're destitute. You're doomed. You have no help. You have no safety. You're not able to help yourself. This is the cause of a widow. What's a widow to do? Luke 11. Luke 11. What's a widow to do? <clears throat> Your rest is gone. You, you used to rest and trust in false righteousness and now that's been stripped it's been showed that it's wrong what's what was up is now down and what was wrong is now right everything's been changed around you're a widow luke 11 verse 9 and i say unto you ask ask and it shall be given you seek and you shall find knock and the door will be opened unto you for everyone that asks receives he that seeketh findeth and to him that knocketh it shall be opened if you've been made a widow Open your mouth unto God Almighty and tell Him 
you're a widow. You're poor, you're destitute. You have no hope in your life anymore. Your false God has been shown to be the horror that it is, the wickedness that it is, the death that it is, the stink that it is, the stench. God continues to teach in verse 11, if a son shall ask bread of any of you as a father, will you give him a stone? If, if your son comes and asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? Or if they ask for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? No, it, even wicked men being evil know how to give good gifts unto the children. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You find out that you're a widow, ask God Almighty for salvation cry unto him christ at this time when he was teaching these words to his people during his earthly ministry started casting out devils at this point in verse 14. it came to pass the devil was gone out and the dumb spake and the people wondered but some came in and said he cast out by through beelzebub the chief of the devils look at verse 19. christ answered and says if i be of the devil and I cast out devils. By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. If you accept your, your prophets and not me, but I can cast out devils and your sons can't, you're really worshiping the devil. Verse 20, But I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. No doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, visits his people and with his single finger, he casts out your first husband. He casts out your devil. He casts out your false confidence, your false trusts, the things that you used to rest on, the things that you used to rely on. And he says in verse 21, when a stronger man armed, that's your first husband. When the stronger man armed, keepeth his palace, that's you, a prisoner to him. Goods are at peace. You thought you were at peace before God Almighty turned your world upside down and made you a widow, killed everything you used to love spiritually and religiously, showed it for what it is, the stench that it is. Verse 22, but when a stronger than he shall come, the Lord Jesus Christ, and overcome Satan in your life, kill your first husband, he taketh from him all his armor wherewith he trusted and deliver and divideth his spoil. He frees you from that first husband destroys him out of your life and you find you're just a widow you're helpless and doomed hmm, amazing amazing the apostle paul when he went through this process he sat for three days a widow hmm, what's god going to do to me i don't have peace i'm a widow my false gods have been stripped away there i've shown he's shown me what they are i, I i'm a widow he cried, he asked, he pleaded, he begged. He was a widow indeed. The Ethiopian eunuch on the chariot ride, hearing the gospel message, found out he's a widow. What hinders me from being baptized and joined to this Savior, to this Messiah, to Christ? Nothing. If you believe with every bit of your being, be baptized. Rest on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's true salvation. That's the power that truly saves. Not, your, not the works of your hands. Not the things your first husband taught you and cared for you with and gave you a false confidence in. That's all dead now. Be a widow by God's grace to see that you're doomed lest God save you by his hand and his might and his power. By his tender hand and power and might. <clears throat> the precious thing about being a widow there's a new marriage it's always there the apostle Paul had to wait three days to see Christ to see there is a new husband to take care way better than the first way no fear of death anymore no corruption no browbeating about your past only love and forgiveness and tender mercy, all based on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the behalf of the sinner. This is what it is to come to know Christ savingly and to be remarried as a widow to Christ, to actually know that I'm resting now. Apostle Paul needed three days. What do you need? You need three days? You need three years to ask? 
to cry, to plead that you're a widow? What do you need? Our text, I don't want you to turn around to that text, but I got it right here at the bottom of your outline. Look at the text in 1 Kings 17, 24. If you didn't see it, when I read it, the widow had peace when she saw one thing, her resurrected son. Spiritual widows have one peace and one peace only when they see Christ resurrected for them. They're restored. They're made whole, all based on Christ's work for them. By this I know, the widow's voice said this when she finally rested. By this I know, the resurrected son, by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the world, the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. The word of the message that's in the mouth of the preacher is Christ. When she saw the resurrected son alive and well, when you see the resurrected son of God alive and well for you, that's the one that you'll sit down in and rest in and be married to throughout all eternity. So have you been widowed is the question of the message tonight. Have you been widowed? Turn to Luke chapter 4. Jesus and his earthly ministry went back to his hometown at one point. And of course his custom was to Go to church. Worship God Almighty. And he went into the synagogue and they actually gave him a book, the scriptures, and asked him to read. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, Christ began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor widow. To the poor widow. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted widows the widows, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of the sights to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. He kills your first husband. He slaughters Satan in your life. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and all the eyes of them were upon him in the synagogue. And he said, verse 21, this day is a scripture fulfilled in your ears. I've never seen this in verse 22. And all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceed out of his mouth. The gracious words, the full of grace and mercy and tenderness. To who? The poor, the brokenhearted, the ones that used to be captive, the widows that are now freed mentally from Satan's clutch of lies and fear and torment. And they said, well, isn't this just Joseph's son? Turn to verse 24. Verily I say unto you, no prophet's accepted his own country. Christ said what it was. But he continues, but I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias. When the heaven is shut up three years and six months, when the great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, except unto a woman that was a widow. A, a widow in need. Are, are you a widow in need? Salvation is to those specific <clears throat> widows in need. If ye are, cry unto God for mercy. Fear not, widow. That's the title of the message. Fear not. Your God saves sinners. 